Score, the podcast. The only show taking you inside the studios of the world's most celebrated composers and musical storytellers. Presented by Spitfire Audio. I'm Kenny Holmes. I am Robert Kraft. This is Score the Podcast presented by Spitfire Audio. We're off and running after a big season premiere. And here we go. Episode two. Saying hello, as always, to to composer Carol. Good morning, Carol. Good morning. You guys ready? Are you caffeinated? We have another big one here. I would say if you look up over-caffeinated in the dictionary, they have a full-page picture of me. How about you? You're the coffee man. I actually haven't had my coffee today yet, so that's you guys incredible. might have to carry I'm this I'm having one. mine. I think um, that's, a, that's a headline right there. It, it really is. Um, okay, I have a trivia question for Shoot. you. Who, please name the most Oscar winning music, musical person living right now. Oh, living. Cause I was going to say, I know non-living Oscar nominated or winning Oscar winning. Who has the most Oscars of a living musical person today? Well, there, first of all, there's going to be, a, I mean, of course, I was going to say Maestro John Williams, but when you say musical person, it makes me think. It's not John Williams. Is it composer Carol? Carol? Is it me? It is not you. <laughs> or is it our, <laughs> the, our guest today? The answer Perhaps? is our guest today, oh, Mr. Alan Mankin, mm. eight-time Oscar-winning composer and songwriter i was i thought it would have been john williams but when i looked it up the the only person that has more oscars than alan Menken in the musical sense is al alfred newman correct david so, newman's father and Thomas. that's newman's correct father. so on today's show is uh, an icon uh he's a composer he's a songwriter for so many of the greatest animated films first off i mean he's the the disney savior uh, when in terms of animation uh, with music, films like Little Mermaid, uh, Aladdin, Pocahontas, Hercules, Beauty and the Beast, and and then all the non Disney stuff as well. One of your favorites, Robert, uh, Newsies. Oh, love Newsies. Um, so anyway, Alan is you know who Alan is at this point if you're listening to the show, I think. But um, we are so excited to have him on because. We, we've been trying to get him on for a couple of seasons and some scheduling things didn't work out, but he's got the new Little Mermaid live action coming up. So we're going to be able to talk to him about that, working with Lin-Manuel Miranda. Uh, and then mm-hmm. also he recently had the live action Aladdin come out with, with Will Smith and doing that whole thing. So he's, it's kind of interesting, Robert, right? I mean, he, he went through this wave of these massive hit films and now they're kind of redoing them all not in the same order, but but th- this is an interesting experiment. Where, where do you stand on all of this stuff with the remakes and the live action? I think that, first of all, there's obviously a commercial angle. Disney just knows how to extend the brand of all these different mm-hmm. movies and not only sequels, but live action and all that. I also think... It's sort of a wonderful opportunity for Alan to revisit his work, I'm guessing, and we can find out when we talk to him. And also maybe in each one of them, there's going to be a new song or two. So he has to come back to some narrative issues that maybe weren't addressed. That sounds really official. Um, (laughs) And uh, listen, God bless them all. There's, I think the world probably needs a few more little mermaids and beauty and the beast and things that make people so happy you can tell we asked if people had favorite alan menken movies and scores mm, and mm-hmm. in the score all over the place. and it was just so many of them came back you thought this guy's really entertained the world so yeah makes me happy well and plus you worked with him on little mermaid i sure uh, did all those years ago and what i think it's been 30 years since that film just well just since i'm 31 years. years old i did start i was in diapers <laughs> when i went down to record plant on sycamore to do that wow. yeah it's been 30 plus years and i had no idea what i was getting into i got a call from 
Chris Montan, the head of music at Disney, asking if I'd be interested in producing. These two guys, Alan Menken and Howard Ashman, uh, with this musical they had at Disney. And it was sort of, I guess, yeah, it's work. Boy, and I- we've talked about how this was a time when it was a rebirth of Disney, right? Because th- before Little Mermaid, it wasn't this big, huge, anticipated, what's the next Disney musical movie that's coming out? And, and when these guys showed up on the scene, everything changed moving forward. Absolutely revolutionized what and who Disney was. It was 86, I believe. And um, it was the first of a new era that now is, you know, ginormous Disney. But it was a whole new world? Yeah, it's a whole new world. I would say it is a whole new world that is somewhere under the sea with a hunchback. <laughs> uh, so anyway, Alan Mankin joining the show in just a bit, and we're really excited about him. Um, by the way, Robert, I'm wearing the T-shirt you gave me for my birthday, and so if there's any problems today, just read this uh, manual on my shirt. Happy belated birthday, Kenny. Fixed in post. Thank you. Yes. We'll fix it in post. I told Robert I would wear it on uh, on this week's episode. I'm so. so happy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, before we get to, um, the show here, uh, we want to take a second to thank our sponsor, Spitfire Audio, maker of orchestral sample libraries for film composers, whether you're just starting out or a seasoned professional, Spitfire has so many sounds you will love. Did you know that they release a new library in their free lab series every month? And I download them i mean it's a great freebie and they're always really cool you can get an entire orchestra for free in the form of their bbc symphony orchestra discover edition yeah and those are on top of the free stuff uh we they they have a ton of different packages um and we have a promo code that we're going to share with you at the end of this episode you're going to hear a demo from their latest abbey abbey road one release it's called wondrous flutes and this package features fast flowing and fun. That's really fun to say. Thanks for that script, Ben. Fast flowing and fun. Fast flowing and fun. Uh, and piccolo performances, flute and piccolo for- performances with dazzling legato patches. Wondrous flutes has been captured within the cinematic acoustics of Abbey Road Studios, Studio One, by London's first call session players. So, all the best players playing these sounds. And uh, these pre-orchestrated patches give you instant access to an immediately recognizable sound as heard in some of the great scores recorded there in Abbey Road 1, uh, Studio 1, like John Williams scores, John Powell, a lot of those uh, Star Wars uh, sounds that you're familiar with. Those are the types of sounds you're going to hear in these packages. I can't deny that whenever I think about Studio 1, I get slightly happy Mm -hmm. because Studio 1 is just one of the great places, if you love film music, to just walk into that space. It makes you joyful knowing what has been recorded in that room. Plus, you can feel the energy. This is a secret I'd like to share with our score listeners. There's a couch upstairs that if you've flown overnight from L.A. and you have to make a 10 o'clock session at Abbey Road 1, and at 10 the downbeat starts and everybody seems to be fairly organized and it's going great. And Isabel Griffiths, the great contractor has everything under control. You can sneak upstairs to that couch and just say, you're going to close your eyes for a minute because you've been on a plane all night. And then about one o'clock, someone gently shakes you and says lunch. <laughs> so it's a, it's a well-known secret that that's a, that's a, and Los Angeles to London tradition. That's, uh, that, that area, by the way, gives me nightmares because I think I've shared this before, but if, if you haven't heard the story, when we were shooting Score, the documentary there, we were setting all of our stuff up and we had uh, the conversion plugs and everything for our lighting. And right before Mission Impossible was going to start recording, we blew the circuit in Studio One and uh, we had about six engineers up there. They came up faster than an ambulance. Oh, what's going on? Well, this is the sector that the, the power went out. And we're like, oh, no. 
And uh, so from then on, that was like our, it was like never plug anything in, in any of these places until you check with somebody. Wow. Um, good so to know. They that couch, I, I had the opposite effect. I needed to be resuscitated on that couch after, uh, after I that bet. incident. I actually um, arrived and then we'll get back to our score of the podcast, but I arrived once for some scoring date at Abbey Road and they got started and you know you fly overnight you'd land at Heathrow at like 6 30 in the morning you'd have a coffee get in a cab go right to Abbey Road and they'd be ready to go at 10 you could do it um and you always thought ambitiously I can handle this I'll go through the first day and then I'll go to sleep at night well that couch was there and once I went upstairs to that couch after it had gotten started just to see and they had put yellow tape like a police line over it and it said <laughs> on above it hold for robert Kraft." they knew my secret sneaking out there <laughs> did you know that score listeners the that our podcast listeners can save 25 percent off their first purchase of any spitfire audio product you just have to be able to tell one of these abbey road stories and use the promo code score 2021 that's all one word score 2021 you get for that use of the promo code 25 percent off that's huge yeah and then once again listen for that demo at the end of the show today and use the promo code if you want to purchase any of those uh, packages as a first time purchaser of spitfire products save 25 percent from us to you we're so glad to bring that to you um robert we have uh, something to bring back. We, we didn't do it last week, but that's the wrong button. Where's my noise? That's what we're going to bring back? There it is. There it is. The return of the mailbox. It is breaking news, though. It is breaking news. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a message here from Aaron Daniel Jacob, and he has a question about representation. Uh, hi, Kenny and Robert. Longtime fan. First time emailer. How imperative is it for a media composer to have an agent or manager to help them find jobs? I'm just breaking into making some money, writing music for TV. I have no agent and all my jobs come from connections I've made from former clients who want, me, want to use me again or recommend me to someone else. This seems to be the norm for a lot of folks, but I've heard... But I've heard of an equal amount of composers who rely heavily on their representation for their next gig. So what are the benefits and disadvantages of having or not having representation? It's a fabulous question, Aaron Daniel Jacob. You have three first names, so I guess you can move them around all the time. Um, but I'll call you ADJ for now. And I'm gonna ADJ. I'm gonna tell you that you have asked a wonderful question. And one that is the great riddle of anyone in the entertainment business as a performer, creator, writer, actor, musician, which is, how do I get work without an agent? How do I get an agent without work? So mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you that you've answered the question in your question. You say, I get most of my work, and thank you and congratulations for doing this all on your own, through word of mouth. Here's my question for you, because you've asked the question yourself. What happens if I am producing something, and I'm watching my small screen at home, and I hear something I really like, and I look it up, and it's Aaron Daniel Jacob composed the music. I don't know you. I don't have anybody to ask word of mouth. I want to find you. What do I do? Well, the first thing I would do as a producer in Hollywood or in New York or in London is I'd go to IMDB and I'd go to your page and I'd look for your contact info and I would hope for my sake, not for yours, but for mine, that you're represented by someone I know and deal with. Because then there's a shorthand I can have, which is I can call up one of the agents or agencies and say it says here you represent this person um what do they like to charge what can you tell me more about them um would they be available would they be interested this would be in place of me calling you directly which would be uncomfortable as your career expands because 
the last thing I want to do is negotiate with you. In other words, what would it be like if I wanted Alexander Desplat to score my next movie? Do you think I would call, and God bless you, Aaron, that you become <laughs> the next Alexander Desplat? But you can see where I'm going here, which is as your career expands, having an agent is going to be extremely necessary because, number one, it gives you complete cred. If your agent is one of the agents that producers deal with or studios deal with, you're instantly in a new club, which is, oh, yep. you're part of a crew that, that I understand and I can walk the walk and talk the talk with these representatives. We know what to ask. I don't want to call you. Let's say I find your cell phone from a friend of a friend of a friend or I track you down. Hey, man, what do you charge? Well, you have to now say, uh, well, I, I really don't know. Depends what, you know, no agent would negotiate like that. And are you available? Well, I'm not sure. I, I don't want to have that conversation with you. I want to call your representative, say, here's the budget. Can he do it for this? Can he do it for that? Is he available in May? Is he available in November? Yes or no? In or out? Let's go. And your agent hopefully will say, yes, he's available. Yes, he's affordable. Isn't it possible too, if let's say using the Alexander Desplat uh, example, someone calls and says, we want Desplat to score this movie. And they say, boy, that's way out of your budget. But on our, on our roster is Aaron Daniel Jacob, who is a hot up and comer. He has a great sound. He can do those types of despla sounds that you like um let let's let let him do up a little demo here and show you what he can do and maybe that's the way uh aaron daniel jacob gets his first sort of big budget feature is he's a little bit less expensive than uh despla absolutely correct in other words there's kind of a major league all yeah. the teams that are major league. Yeah, I always like it. Sports is the best everybody way. everybody else. Yep. Yeah. If I run to find you, I'm going to go to look at the rosters of the Yankees, the Dodgers, the Padres. The We could go through all 32 teams. If you're not on one of those, it's a little bit of, well, you're a really good player, I hear. But I don't yeah. know where to find you. By the way, I'll end my soliloquy about why agents are important this way. Can you tell me one major composer who doesn't have an agent? Call me when right. you find that answer. I can tell you that John Barry, for a minute, used his lawyer, but then came back to an agent. Uh, yeah. John Barry, rest in peace. So there is that occasional, but he's John Barry. I mean, you go see Out of Africa or James Bond and you want to reach John Barry, well, you just figure out who knows him. But... The My tough question seems to be when to get the agent. As soon as that, one it's says It's the chicken to you. or the egg thing. Yeah. yeah. As soon if as someone one says reaches to you, out to you and says, I want to be your agent, it's probably a good time to be an agent. To be, correct. To have and they will reach out to you when you have some things happening. That Excellent. is our score, the mailbox answer for the day. Yes. Aaron Daniel Jacob, thanks for that question. If you have a question for the show, you can email us at score the mailbox at epicleft.com, E P I C L E F F.com. We'll try to answer your question on the show or uh, on Twitter or Facebook if uh, you have those uh, ways of connecting with us as well. We can do it like that. Um, I do want to mention too, don't forget to subscribe to more score. If you haven't done so already, we already have a ton of our listeners who have joined and it's a lot of fun. We have, uh, exclusive interviews that aren't on the show here at score the podcast. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had Carlos Rafael Rivera from the Queens gambit. Uh, most recently we had Fernando Arroyo Lascarain, who is a studio musician, uh, here in Hollywood and also happens to be the composer of blockbuster Matt's, uh, podcast. And uh, Fernando had some great, great insight on the orchestra, the working orchestra uh, in, during recording sessions on the stage. Um, so, you know, you may know about the orchestras in general, but uh, it's, it's a different working beast behind closed doors in those sessions. And he opens the curtain, peels the curtain back for us 
And uh, here's a little clip I'm going to play you of him talking about playing in scoring sessions, cold reading music that gives you goosebumps and trying to play impossible cues composers have written. I've played some scores where, you know, we'll have a quarter note, like a hundred for like this. And they want us to play two octave run in one beat. Impossible. It's not going to happen, you know? There's just your fingers kind of move that fast. What do you do if something's not possible? Have you been in a session where something literally All can't be done? And then what, what happens? Yeah, it is seems it, does like it done? that actually, <laughs> that probably happens we a make lot, it happen with composers. But how do you... professional faking. <laughs> 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 well, I'll show you. So if I have a fast string scale, let's say even if it's an octave, let's say A flat major, right? Right? And I'm playing it, kind of playing all the notes. But if it's faster than that, I might go. You just so you get the same effect, it. but it's kind of, I'm sort of skipping some notes. Such a cool conversation. Uh, you guys got to go check it out. More score on Patreon. It's an exclusive place for bonus episodes. We have uh, hangouts with the crew. And there's also exclusive merchandise. There's a really sweet coffee mug on there and an exclusive t-shirt. Um, so don't miss out if you want more score. That's literally what it is. Uh, it's going to be year round too. So when the season ends for score, the podcast here, more score continues on Robert, you got some stuff I know you're working on and really excited about more score. Go check that out on Patreon today. And, uh, do we have anything else to get to before we get to Alan Macon? I think we need to get right into a whole new world. Oh, this is amazing. Had to bring that back. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's time then. Uh, we're going to take a break. When we come back, eight-time Oscar-winning composer Alan Menken joins the show. Stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, it's Matt Schrader here. If you like Score the Podcast, you're going to want to check out More Score, our new Patreon show for Score superfans. What's Patreon? Well, it's a website and an app that lets fans crowdfund the type of extra content you want. And now, More Score has it all on video. You can listen or watch right on the Patreon app. More Score already has the life stories of people you know, like Kenny and Robert from Score the Podcast, as well as bonus features, hangouts, and yes, original interviews, like Carlos Rafael Rivera from The Queen's Gambit on Netflix. Did you know he had to throw out his score and start fresh? More Score gives you insight into the film score world, and it's a beautiful addition to those of you who just can't wait for another episode of Score the Podcast. Best of all, More Score is year-round. No more off-season. Go to patreon.com slash more score or download the Patreon app and search More Score. Hello, this is Pinar Toprak. You're listening to Score the Podcast. Now let's go back to the show. Welcome back to Score the Podcast, presented by Spitfire Audio. What a huge guest for our show today. He's a legendary songwriter and composer. Check this out. Eight Oscars, 11 Grammys, seven Golden Globes, a Tony, and most recently an Emmy in 2022, which gave him the E in EGOT, making him only the 16th person to join the exclusive club of EGOT status. Alan Mankin joining the show today. A particular treat for me, of course, because <laughs> we go way back, but it's just wonderful. Alan, I think when I first met you, none of the things that Kenny just read off had occurred. So it's really amazing to hear that list. And I can actually say that really shop worn cliche. I knew him when. I yes, and I knew you. I I knew you when I I remember your first album cover and uh, oh walking on the God. street. Remember those those pants? Yeah. Do you get something for EGOT status? Do you get a card? Do you get like no reservations <laughs> at all restaurants? Like wh there's only 16 people in the world with that status. Do they give you anything for that? I, th I think you get like a CVS coupon of some kind, you know. Nice. Um, <laughs> They're long, those long receipts. You get, well, what, you, you get your... Uh, your your agent Richard Kraft stopping complaining about it, so that's a that's a big plus. Oh, wow, that's huge. Because um, for years he was saying he was saying 
one more and you got the ego. I said, I I'm fine. He said, oh, one more and you got the ego. I said, okay. But I, 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 oh, you should have the ego. So I to, but he said it enough. I, I, got, I began to go, okay, I should the, have the ego. If I'm not mistaken, was it the daytime Emmy adding the E? Was that the, the coup de grace? Yes, yes. And I, the coup de grace was the, was the daytime Emmy. We had actually, Howard, Howard Ashman and I had actually gotten an honorary Emmy all the way back, actually, I think maybe before any of the other awards for a song that Roy Disney asked us to write, um, which was a, uh, a anti-drug uh, song uh, called A Million Wild and Wonderful Ways to Say No, which given my background was a little ironic, but um, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so it's always an honorary one, but getting the official one took a now you got the real deal. I actually real remember deal. Roy Disney coming into the record plant when we were working on Little Mermaid, staring at a computer synthesizer. A, you know, it was like the DX7 without the keyboards. It was just a lot of blinking lights. And he looked at it and he right. said, for the for some reason, he said, Do you have a tuba in that thing? <laughs> I, I don't know why Roy Disney would be concerned, but uh, Alan, it was it was so great. I mean, I know we wanted to talk about all your films, but I said to Kenny and Carol before we started that I just wanted to mention to Alan the most surprising fact of everything he's written. I was incredibly moved by, for personal reasons, Newsies, which... Which oh, wow. I know that everyone must acclaim all the other things, but I heard the song King of New York. I went with my mother to see the film, and I thought it's one of the three songs in the world that I wish I'd written. It just nailed it. Oh, and I thought, thank uh, you. I just, and Santa Fe, I always love that score, and I know everyone talks about all your other work, but. Newsies went unheralded. Of course, it came back as a Broadway hit. But I won film, my Tony for it. I you know. won your Tony for it. But the film, and, for whatever reason. And my ahead, Razzie. Yeah. Oh, I got no. my Razzie Award for, for, for Newsies. The film? Yeah. Yeah, worst song of the year. The no night way. I, won, I, I found it the night I won the, uh, the two Oscars for Beauty. I was back in the press room. And they said, how does it feel to win the song for worst song of the year. And I thought it was a joke. I said, ah, bad <laughs> joke. He said, no, no, no. You won the Razzie Award for worst song. And that was for the song High, um, uh, high Times, Hard Times. Um, high Times, Hard. Great. You know, at, remember, remember uh, uh, Anne Margaret on the Swing. Um, a classic. And, well, <laughs> so let me, let me reintroduce you then. The Regot winner... Alan Mankin joining the show today. And uh, <laughs> Riga, let's, let's, a Razzie. let's go back. Let's go back because, um, you know, a lot of us know your story, but we kind of want to dive in a little bit. So you were you were born in Manhattan. Is that correct? Correct. So you you were just surrounded by Broadway. Um, were you were you in a musical family? Were, was your family involved in musicals well, or plays, or what? What drew no. you to that? Um, they weren't professionally involved. They were passionately involved as fans. My father and all the men in my family, as I've said many times, were dentists. Every single one of them. My grandfather was a dentist. My father's father. My father was a dentist. My father's brother was a orthodontist. My Mother's sister's husband was a dentist. My father's sister's husband was a dentist. It was just like my wow. mom. Den dentist, dentist. Um, so, but my dad would love to sit at the piano and play. And my mother was an actress and writer, um, but, and a dentist's wife in New Rochelle. And that's primarily what she did was, you know, be a great mom. And, but she, but she would work and they were very um, involved with, you know, uh, entertainment business, I guess, in terms of being fans. Um, and I was just, I was one of those kids who was born just wanting to make music. It was just clearly in my blood. And um, I remember 
and from the earliest time just being attached to music. And then I remember, I said, you know, the, when Fantasia came out, and there was these great images with this great classical music. Then, then images and music became married in my brain. I think, um, mm -hmm. and I really was not good at anything else. I was so ADD. I was a horrible student. Like, I said, how am I going to be a dentist? I mean, I. <laughs> I have to be a dentist, I, I think, how do I do this? And then, um, thank God I found a way to not Were you, be a dentist. Did you jump into piano lessons at an early age? Um, was your Were your parents okay with that? Or were they saying, why aren't oh, you learning okay. what a cavity is? Well, yes, they were in fact saying, Alan is practicing for an hour, but he's not learning the piece. Uh, the teacher would say, Alan's not learning the pieces. But, say, but he's playing it for, the, for an hour. And I had to admit I was learning the beginning of a Beethoven sonata and then I would make up my own because I got bored and I also didn't like having to read somebody else's notes apparently. I um, love hearing that. Did you write, I mean, in other words, was writing and thinking of your own songs an early instinct? It was, but I didn't know what it was. I thought I was, all I thought I was doing was just faking it. <laughs> you know, that, that was good enough. For, uh, at, my, at that age, it was good enough for me. I'm just like, okay, you know, no, it's, it's easy. I'm, I'm not, just sorry. I, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. perfectly. And it, the same thing happened to us here. So, as someone tried to FaceTime me. I, I, I don't know how to turn on Do Not Disturb on this. That, that, was, that was the great Glenn Slater calling me, my lyricist, because we have a meeting on a project and supposedly his, he, was, he was supposed to deliver a new lyric this morning but it never came well I, apparently uh -oh. i'm not coming back on the screen so Ooh. i don't know and we're back so we were we, we were what we were uh, uh, you hear me okay everything yeah okay? all there we're all there okay so uh we were talking about um i guess how i developed you know that uh, fantasia and these and the visuals and that really became huge for me. And oh, I, I was about to say I wasn't good at anything else. I was not a good student. Um, and you said you thought and, when you were writing songs at the beginning, you weren't really aware you were writing songs. You were, said you were kind of like faking, you know, the composition. Yeah. That yeah, I, you know, I, I, I did not. I, I, no, no kid thinks that actually making music is a viable way to make a living. If your if your father was a lawyer or a doctor or a you know t teacher or whatever, you go, I'm going to make music, and they go, yeah, great, right. Um, and I still pinch myself that you know mm. it worked. <laughs> At so what nice. point did you did you start to take it like really serious though? I mean, everyone, I think I played viola in elementary school, and then it kind of phased out, but. At what point do you take the next step and you think like, wow, I'm really good at this or I should pursue this as, as something? Well, to be honest, when every other option was <laughs> either too, too unappealing or, or not, not doable, um, I, I went to college as a pre-med um, wow. and did not last more than you know, a couple of classes because I just was not, you know, the people who were really driven were driven and i was not plus it was those years i went to, i started college in 1967 so you could pretty much those were the years when we were all counterculture or many of us were and i was very counterculture um i grew up as a kid with a peptic ulcer i was very tense so you know the 60s late 60s were kind of a boon to my nervous system it was like hey let's party um and, um, but after college, it's like, okay, I got to make a living now. Whoops. Um, the first thing I did was like, well, I had my old classical repertoire and I'm good at faking music. So I began to play for ballet and dance classes all over the city. I uh, wrote a rock ballet and I met a ballet dancer named Janice Roswick, who I've now been married to for nearly 50 years. Um, and um, I Bravo. joined I think a that workshop. deserves some applause. Um, Thank you. That's so great. Was she um, in the rock ballet by any chance? 
Yes. Oh, she nice. She walked into the room, and I and I was like, oh my god, this is. It was like totally. I, I must know this 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 girl. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I joined this BMI musical theater workshop. Layman Engel. Um, with Layman Engel. And I remember I, the, as, the first day I walk in, there's also, my, you know, someone who become a dear friend of mine, Maury Eston, hmm. um, was there. He was a graduate student at Yale um, at the time. And of course, Maury then, you know, became, he's a writer of Nine and Titanic and the, the state musical Titanic um, and many other wonderful musicals. But I did, from that point on, I just said, I'm, no matter what happens, this is what I'm going to do with my life. I was writing jingles, um, and I became a part of that scene. Uh, I was playing in clubs at the ballroom, and you know, you remember the clubs, ballroom, Tramps, Reno Sweeney, um, uh, Snafu. Um, <laughs> not, I wasn't quite at CBGB level, but I remember Snafu. Um, and I was just play, making music, you know, in any way possible. Um, but to appease my parents, I, that workshop was vital to me. Um, and somehow the marriage of the, you know, the classical music I grew up with and the pop music that we all, you know, be, inculcated ourselves with and the structure of musical theater, um, and my genuine gen, general nature as a chameleon kind of where I, you know, I, I'm, I'm able to take on musical style and just kind of have fun with it and, and make it my own. Um, that led to me finding a voice in musical theater that became um, huge for me. I think you just my, answered my, a question, which is, you know, was pop or rock or being a kind of solo artist or a recording artist, a lane that was interesting yes. to you or was musical yes. theater it? Yes, no, it was interesting. Look, I, when I saw your album cover, Robert, <laughs> I was jealous. <laughs> I wanted to I wanted to record an album, but I was Janice I, I put were married. Um I was working on musicals. I didn't want to do the tour thing. <laughs> uh that it, it always felt exhausting to me and I, and for years I struggled with that. Well, I should make an album and I in fact had a deal with um, Columbia Records then, you know, now Sony, um, to, to, to make an album. And I just kept putting it off and putting it off, and putting it off because I had other projects and I didn't, I knew I had to support it with a campaign of performing. And I just didn't want to put some time aside to do that. And it's, it's so difficult. Um, and I actually found my greatest asset in allowing my voice to come through characters Ooh. and through stories and through situations and have it not be about what is Alan Menken feeling in his heart or thinking. And, and also I went from being a composer lyricist to being a composer, you know, 90% of the time a composer with other lyricists and a lot of other lyricists. Um, and that was so liberating um, to huh. have a lyricist like, Howard Ashman or Stephen Schwartz or Tim Rice or David Zippel or Glenn Slater, Jack Feldman. He's incredibly talented. I have people. the list here. I actually made uh, Lynn Aaron's even made, <laughs> made the list Lynn, and, and Pasek and Paul. I mean, you've been certainly collaborated. Uh, with tremendous. Yeah, talent. Well if I can, if I can recommend oh, wow. to our listeners to go watch the Howard uh, documentary on Disney Plus, which really tells a great story about you and Howard. But for those that haven't seen it, can you tell us a little bit about how you and Howard Ashman, um, the great sure, lyricist, sure. came to be a, a, a dynamic duo in Hollywood? Well, first we were a dynamic duo off, 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 off Broadway. I um, went to that show, by I, the way. I was jealous of you. See, Which it one? all comes Rosewater? back. Little Shop of Horrors. No, I saw I saw that <laughs> on oh, Second right. Avenue. Oh, my manager it. took me. Said you could be doing yeah. something like this, at, and we went to the Orpheum to see it. And here we are, Je yeah. jealous of each other. And here we are. <laughs> I um um yeah. I I was a exclusively a composer lyricist, and I get a call from actually from Maury Yeston, 
and I'll, I'll do my Maury impression. Alan, it's Maury. Uh, there's this guy, How? There's this guy, Howard Ashman, who uh, um, uh, is has the rights to do a Vonnegut novel, but, but he wants to write the lyrics as, as well. I, would you be interested? I said, well, sure. You know, I'll help him out. Why not? I'll meet with him. So I met with Howard. Howard also had a theater, the WPA theater, that he was artistic director of. Um, and that was a huge, you know, step up. Um, and I, I was a big Vonnegut fan. So, yes, make a long story short, Howard and I got together then and wrote God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, um, which was a success to steam. It, it got a good review in the New York Times, hmm. but it 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 was had one problem. It was a off-Broadway show with a cast of 14. Hmm. And the, it just can't price it out. It would have to move to Broadway, but it didn't have that Broadway sensibility. And Howard said, okay, next show, is going to be no more than nine characters uh, um, and, cl and with some sort of a device in the middle of it that's really attention catching. Mm -hmm. And he always had this idea of the Corman movie, The Little Shop of Horrors. And so, yes, with, with Little Shop of Horrors and that, you know, Muppet made eating plant, we had our breakthrough. And, um, and when Little Shop was produced, we had... We had a general manager, Albert Poland, who wanted to help us find our producers. In New York, those producers were the Schubert organization. In London, it was Cameron McIntosh. And in Los Angeles, it was David Geffen. That was the same group of people who had done Cats, and they came together to produce Little Shop. Fast forward, flash forward, Jeffrey Katzenberg and Michael Eisner then are coming, and they are now running Disney. And they're looking for who is a person who can help us figure out how to incorporate music into our into, yeah, a new generation of music into our movies. And I'm sure I'm sure Jeffrey spoke to David Geffen, who said, "Get Howard Ashman." Um, at that time, Howard and I actually were working with different people. He was working with Marvin Hamlish on a smile on a movie called on a musical called Smile. I was working with Tom Ian, who had written Dream Girls on a, on a musical called Kicks. So for me, the big headline was, "Oh, I'm going to get to work with Howard again! Yay!" You know, our our follow up to Little Shop of Horrors, and it was uh, of course Little Mermaid, um, and it was yeah, I think it was through probably through David Geffen that Howard brought me out to um, to work on Mermaid. We had the experience with Little Shop of Horrors when. It, it was became a film um, that I remember we got a nomination for best score for Little Shop of Horrors, uh, Golden Globes. I said, wow, and who, it's great. Yeah, but it's not you. It's a wonderful writer, uh, Miles Goodman. Miles Goodman had written basically eight minutes of a musical sort of transition um, <laughs> and I wasn't eligible because everything I had written had been written for the stage. So when it came time, um, we did, however, get a best song nomination, which was, you know, for Oscar, which was great for Mean Green Mother. But when it came time to do Little Mermaid, Howard said, you have to write the score. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, I don't know how to write a score. He said, well, you'll figure it out. That's and never stopped any that, Hollywood film composer. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and um, Chris Montan and, uh, helped set me up with um, an orchestrator, Thomas Pazettieri, who also understood how to use, there was this thing called the Knudsen book, I remember, which would, because you, you work with actual clicks, not beats per minute. And all of that technique about how we would work. Um, and so I, struggled to learn how I was working with the DHS tapes and I remember Simpty co code with that, that audible code that we had that would, <laughs> um, that would drive the, the, the MIDI and the, uh, on the movie together. And at some point in that process, I'm looking at, I'm doing it. I'm playing what I, what I wrote, you know, on the page with the Newton numbers and I want to play it and to hear it. And at some point, it occurred to me, duh, <laughs> I could just be writing directly to the video. Mm. 
um, and just going beats per minute. And so that's Alan. There's a was, there's a common thread here in this story, and it, and it comes up so much with film composers that we talk to, and it's it's that you had no idea what you were doing on your first movie. Were you telling people you didn't know what you were doing? <laughs> yeah, yes, and and well, I I mean, I, because it was a a musical, meaning song driven. I knew what I was doing. I just didn't know a couple of things. I didn't know the techniques of how you do it. Um, and I didn't know if what I was, what, what was writing as essentially what would be interstitial music for a stage production would be appropriate for a film. What I began doing with Little Mermaid was deliberately aping the old classic Disney scores. So if you listen to Little Mermaid, there's a lot of cues that are very, very influenced by almost like 40s or, or 50s style of, of scoring. Plus there was um, what we call Mickey Mousing, which is, you know, a character would move and you'd be able to droop, 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 <laughs> and you'd write it musically. Um, and um, I think A, the, the songs and B, the innocence of what I did is part of what completely captured people with Little Mermaid. Um, and, you know, so I tell the story when we went to the Oscars for Little Shop of Horrors for Mean Green Mother from Outer Space, we're sitting in the middle of this enormous row at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion and Levi Stubbs comes out and sings a song and brings the house down. And I go, I get excited. Oh my God. Then I sort of look at my pocket for the people I want to thank. And, and Howard's hand just comes over and goes, you can relax. You're not getting any awards tonight. <laughs> um, so, okay. But when we went to the Oscars for little mermaid, there we were right on the aisle. Yeah. Um, and um, we won. Can you explain, so you, you come from the theater world and then you, you go into making this film, Little Mermaid, which, by the way, totally changed the future of Disney films. So you guys revolutionized what that is and, and the music in it. But how does your process change when you go into doing a film versus a stage play? Because obviously this has to be animated, so it's not like the normal gig of a composer where you come in at the end and, and write a score. You're, you're almost writing the story with, or you are writing the well, story. Yes. I'd like to say now, however, when you're writing a, a film musical, if you're, if you're the, a songwriter, when you're writing the songs, you're the king. <laughs> <laughs> when you're writing, when you're writing the score, you're the maid. You're I was actually going to ask about your enjoyability factor on those two. In other words, you're, you kind of articulated it there, which is after that Little Mermaid experience of writing the score and figuring it out and doing how how you do it, have you found equal enjoyment? And maybe Richard Kraft would call me up and say, don't let him answer this in scoring. No, it's not. Yes. The answer is yes. I'll tell you why. Um, songwriting is you're trying to uh, to grab a gestalt in a moment and constructing something that that moves story forward that that uses music and, and lyrics in a, in a very specific way to tell the story um and you do that song by song um and it tends to be a very interactive everybody giving their opinion and and, and feedback and and dealing with people's expectations big time um when you're writing the score once you're in the process of writing the score it's you're almost like in your own monastery it's like you block out the world and and for like i don't know six weeks or whatever it is it's just you and that film and and the director but you're really embedding yourself in every moment of the film in a very different kind of way and I'm, in a sense, I'm being the agent for the songwriter in being the, or not the agent, but I'm being a, a catalyst for the songwriter to make sure that the themes emotionally and musically that are established in the songs are carried through and really perfect um, uh, drive the picture. And 
so I yes, I I, I love scoring. Um, and to be to be very bluntly honest, in a lot of cases, um, that especially with the way the finance the way finances of the business works, sometimes scoring the movie is the best way to actually get your to get paid. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's a very important, huge job. Um, and it's very different than being a songwriter. Uh, and to me, it's always, now with Newsies, as you mentioned, I did not write the score. Um, that was, um, oh God. Jack uh, Redford? Jack, Jack, Jack Redford. Jack Redford, um, yeah. who I, He did a great job. I loved working with him. But, yeah. but going back uh, to I my to my, my question, how yeah, early on are you in in the process? And are you in the room with the writers? Because not only are you writing songs for characters on screen, but you're incorporating so many characters into the song. So you kind of have to have a feel for all of these different characters and what punchline they may add into one of your songs or something like that. I imagine right. the songs change a lot over time too, right? With adding those in. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it's it, essentially as you write this, the songs, you're sort of embedding threads stylistic threads into the score a lot of them are very specific you know having a calypso thread for sebastian is a huge color to to pull through the rest of the score having that moving theme for ariel that da -da 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 -da, which is basically the flow of water it embeds something that's, that's memorable that you you put up right at the top of the story and it carries you through the entire picture um, but I liked hearing this, that you're actually, that you're setting actually a whole tone with, with some of these choices, musical choices. Oh God. Yeah. It's all about that. And it's, a, and the thing about, for me, at least, uh, writing a stage or film score is you are essentially ushering people into a world and a world that ideally is defined by the musical choices and um and of course the words and, and, and as well but you know if it's going to be international those worlds are, they're going to go from language to language but the music mm. is going to remain and for me i always want to find a unique world for each of the projects so you know going into little shop with that 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 you know bubblegum rock and roll i and and the phil specter influenced uh you know songs you get the sense of the world you're in with little mermaid having calypso and 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 the aerial theme and a I little never bit thought of, the of that as water to this for, moment uh, that's Ursula incredible again. that water that's just wonderful yeah. and then which others i mean beauty that was and where, where thinking, i went is there is there a is there a a beautiful or a bestial harmonic that, that I'm unaware <laughs> well, of. Well, in a way, but Beauty and the Beast really is is pulling on classic European classical music. It's pulling, and it's if you if you see the look of it, it's very, you know, old Bavaria, like like going back to Snow White and Cinderella. So Beauty is is again very classical Disney, and I I drew on um uh a, a classical music it's, you know bell is very much in a classical vein um mm. it, it's actually influenced by beethoven mm. um and by a very specific a specific sort of it's, it's it's a wink at beethoven's sixth symphony um nice uh uh the pastoral the, the prologue is a wink um and, and just my little, there goes the baker with his tray like mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm. So it's just a little, a little homage. <laughs> um, you look at uh, the, the the prologue very much. You know, Jeffrey Kasselberg fell in love with having the Sansons Carnival of the Animals at the top of the movie. I, I in order to ha not have that literally put in there, I need to re reflect that, and I did with the with the prologue music. Um, you have the classic Maurice Chevalier Boulevard style of, of uh, Be Our Guest and, um, 
and and again Sigmund Romberg operetta with um, Gaston. So these are yeah these are, are deliberate. I want to stay in the world and stay consistent to the world. Then when you get to Aladdin, really our take was it's yes it's 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 an Arab story. It's it's an Arabian fairy you know tale. And but our take was we're doing the Hollywood take on a, a, on the Arabian tale, which is very much like the Hope Bob Hope and, and Bing Crosby road pictures. Very you know a buddy picture um, with with a big Hollywood entertainment patina to it. Um, so that was the so a very exaggerated view of mm, bu, bu, mm, bu, mm. <laughs> go right on the surface to make the point, but then, then you're going into wah, which is very like fat swallow or something. But to <laughs> find those colors, deciding on those colors and using those colors in a way that makes people, even though they don't know it, it's reminding them of threads. And it's a, you know, music is a vocabulary, and you're playing with the vocabulary that people understand on a gut level. So you always try to find that kind of subtext. With Pocahontas, there wasn't really that subtext to draw on. So it really went much more literally into uh, American Indian influences and English influences. We, we have to take a quick break on the show, Alan. Um, but I have, a, I have questions for uh, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin. And we also want to ask you a little bit about the new Little Mermaid um, when we come back. Stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, it's Matt Schrader here. If you like Score the Podcast, you're going to want to check out More Score, our new Patreon show for Score superfans. What's Patreon? Well, it's a website and an app that lets fans crowdfund the type of extra content you want. And now More Score has it all on video. You can listen or watch right on the Patreon app. More Score already has the life stories of people you know, like Kenny and Robert from Score the Podcast, as well as bonus features, hangouts, and yes, original interviews, like Carlos Rafael Rivera from The Queen's Gambit on Netflix. Did you know he had to throw out his score and start fresh? More Score gives you insight into the film score world, and it's a beautiful addition to those of you who just can't wait for another episode of Score the Podcast. Best of all, more score is year round. No more off season. Go to patreon.com slash more score or download the Patreon app and search more score. Hi, this is Max Richter. You're listening to score the podcast. And now let's go back to the show. Welcome back to score the podcast presented by Spitfire audio. We're here with Alan Mankin. So, Alan, I saw a story that uh, Angela Lansbury told about this song, the Beauty and the Beast theme, that she sang this song in one take after a bomb scare. Can you, do you remember this day? Do you know anything about that story from your perspective? I don't really remember. I, I remember something about a bomb scare, but it was, you know, um, I don't remember much about that. Um, there was a bigger, for me, there was a bigger subtext at the time, um, which was, I knew and, and others didn't know that Howard was terminal with AIDS. And he, he was a rail. He was in the studio so weak, um, but putting up a brave front. Um, that I remember intensely. I remember, you know, have David Friedman at that point conducting the orchestra at um, RCA Studios and, um, in Manhattan, and um, or was it? I'm not sure if it was B BMG by then, but it was the, basically the old RCA studios. And we rehearsed the uh, the orchestra. And when we were ready, Angela wanted to go out there and just sing it down with the orchestra, you know, for for reference. And they said, "Well, just in case, why don't we run the tape?" Um, and yeah, it was it was perfect from front to back. Obviously, we followed up with other versions for safety, and I think maybe there's a line here or there that we took from other versions. But yeah, it was so incredibly moving, and we did two on the same day. It was Angela Lansbury doing Beauty and the Beast, and um, um, uh, Jerry Orbach doing Be Our Guest, 
And it was it's just an electrifying day. Well, the story that she told, just so I can, if people haven't heard the story, but she, she says that she was on her way to New York on a flight and there was a bomb scare and oh, her flight right. was getting, her flight was circling and she almost was late. And I don't know if this, the studio executives couldn't get a hold of her, but there was, there was a big confusion. And, and she says that she nailed it in one take off of adrenaline from, from being freaked oh. out by this. Well, yes, I, I, but Angela always nails it because Angela, a, 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 in the moment, Angela Lansbury is magical. She's wonderful. The heart and the class and the and the and everything about her, the beauty um, is right there. So, but yeah, I, I love that story. There's another story about Angela, which was what we, Angela turned us down for playing that role because they, hmm. they sent a demo to her of the song, and she says, I, I don't think it's for me. And I said, what, what are you talking about? Which which demo did you send? I said, well, we said, yours, of course, because we had done one with Howard, which was much more half-spoken, and one with me, which was, tale as old as time, very pop-oriented. And I said, oh, no, 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 send her Howard's version. And she heard Howard's version. She went, oh, I get it. Okay, fine. And, and she did it. You know, Tim um, Rice says never send an Alan Menken demo with him singing because it'll be better than that. Your voice and your <laughs> performance will be better than anybody <laughs> who's going to listen to it. And they'll be scared away oh, by hearing your interpretation yeah. of your own song. So maybe that's Alan, are you, yeah. are you involved in casting um, characters for, for identifying, helping to identify voices like that? Yeah, I, 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 listen, I'm entitled to, and back then I was more involved than I am now. Um, I will tend to be very involved with casting for a stage production at the first casting because you want to set the mold for, for what's to follow to a degree. Um, and certainly early on for the animators we were we were very involved and howard was extremely involved as, as as much as he could be um given you know his the health situation and um the our initial um mold for mrs potts was remember upstairs downstairs it was mrs bridges he wanted mm -hmm. that mrs bridges from upstairs downstairs and then um of course Angela was a, a, a perfect embodiment of perfect. that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, I remember I had done the show, show Kicks with, you know, and Richard White played one of our leads in that. Richard White became our, our guest on. Um, so it was really just, just about getting the right voice and it was not for star casting particularly. What about it's interesting when they that do cast a star who isn't known. I was as just going to say, a, yeah, a singer. In other words, there's, you know, I we both Kenny and I talked about this, which is, of course, you get Angela Lansbury and she doesn't one take. Well, she's performed every night eight times a week, singing in one take, in tune. She understands it. There are actors yeah. who shall go unnamed who have starred in many of the films, who aren't known as singers necessarily. Well, I'll, yes, yes. I'll give you an example of, of, of a good example of, so uh, Danny DeVito played Philocates Phil in, in Hercules. And we had this song, um, one last hope. Hmm. And Danny came in and goes, Oh, no, no. and he, he, Danny's not really a singer, but I knew what da I, I, I had, all I had to do was tell Danny one name and I, and I knew he'll get it. I said, Danny, Jimmy Durante. Hmm. Just to to Jimmy Durante. I'm down to one last hope, and I hope. It. So, for <laughs> you know, for actors who don't sing, um, now th there's also the example of Mel Gibson when he played John Smith, where <laughs> he was. First of all, Mel had was just giving up smoking, so he was already like. <laughs> um, <laughs> he was very game. Uh, and, and I liked working with him, but it was it was like his patience was a bit thin on that one. Um, there, is it um, not an option though? Because, like for example, with Aladdin, it was Scott Wig Wigner. Is that how you say his name? Uh, the yes. he was the voice Scott of Aladdin. Weiner. 
Weiner. Weiner. Yeah. Weiner. He was the the boyfriend on Full House, I think, notably was his his claim to fame. But he was brought in to do Aladdin, but he didn't sing. Was there a, a period where you you tried to get him to sing, and then he realized like we need to go a different route? How does that change? Yeah, I think we try, I think we tried a little bit. Also, the same thing with Jasmine. In both cases, um, we got you know Brad Kane and Leia Salonga to do the singing, and we had a but I, the you know the voices. Same thing with Pocahontas. One person speaking, one person singing. Judy Kuhn. Um, mm. uh, they were both, you know, at the the working uh, paradigm then was okay. Just get one to speak, one to sing. Make sure they match, and we're fine. And it was fine. Um, Is that a tough conversation to have, though? Like to tell the actor, uh, "You're not really a singer, so we're just going to bring somebody in." I wouldn't know because, thank <laughs> God, thank God, I can fob that conversation off on uh, Chris Montan or. Oh, that's um, so great, Chris. One of the directors, <laughs> and Chris is something- great at that, by the way. He is. He's the ultimate diplomat and ambassador. Uh, you said yeah. something earlier that I just thought it's a, it's a very subtle, it's a fine line when you play a song that's, that you said, this is a little Maurice Chevalier or it's a little Jimmy Durante, and you present it, it's very subtle sometimes whether someone could turn to you and go, really? You know, that's too much in a very particular zone and yet you had a way and you have a way of crafting it no pun so that it actually works in the style but i can imagine how many times you've played songs for people i mean so many songs that there was a moment of are are you really going to pr- proceed down that path and you had to be convincing it's just a really yeah, I, wonderful uh, approach. Well, sometimes, sometimes the best approach is go for the bl- for the bleeding obvious. Go <laughs> right at it. Yeah. Um, and have faith that you, as a writer, will have something intrinsically yours that will come mm-hmm. with it. But don't try to reinvent the wheel when when you need a moment where you're basically going to go. I want the audience to know right away. This is what the, the number needs to do. Last thing you want to do is don't 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 make them work to get into the number. Make it as that. direct. I mean, be our guest was an example of that. I I gave Howard the piece of music, da 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 da, da, da which I just played off the top of my head. We had, I remember thinking, Kevin for little girls, and it's very it's very French, and it's very kind of. French, even the melody, it's almost like can can, and there's a feeling and right away. And and it's a really stupid piece of music, stupidly simple, and it's it's designed to be the most easy trampoline for Howard's lyrics to bounce off of. I, I you, you want to establish that where it's, it's French Boulevard, and then get out of the way. I'll give you another example of, um, by the way, of of using a a person as an ex- example to just g- nail it. Uh, we've said this before, and it's, this is in the, um, well, I don't know if it's in the Howard documentary, but we're doing in Beauty and the Beast, new and a bit alarming, when, in, in, when, when Bell sings about the beast, new and a bit alarming. And Howard, who at that point could barely speak, he, could, he, could, he was too sick to be in the studio. He was on the phone lying in a bed as we were working and he said, I told me, said, Howard wants to give a note. Everyone had to be quiet in the studio. And Howard said, tell, tell Paige on that line, alarming, tell her Streisand. <laughs> New and a bit alarming. And boom, <laughs> right there. Um, being able to have those, those touchstone. Oh yeah, I get it. So much of what I do is based on if I don't have an I I get it moment for somebody, I probably have failed. It doesn't mean every moment has to be an I get it, but you need those to, you in order you want to get someone on the ride. <laughs> there's got to be an I get what this ride is. I, you know, I I'm love going on, that. I really love that. It's such a um, 
it's sort of you you've opened a door in a way for uh, someone to walk through right away. It's not uh, it's not a mystery as to where we're going. You you're saying we're going there, but I think you're also glossing over the phenomenal talent it takes to nail that from the first beat. I mean, that's it's direct. I'd like to imagine. Oh yeah, completely. Let's do it that way. But then the let's do it that way is not as easy as you're saying. Yeah, let's no, just do I'm, a I'm, of- I'm, I'm, I, I'm good at what I do. I, I know. I I, 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 I won't <laughs> deny that. Oh, uh, that's re- it's really amazing. You do remind me of one other thing, though. When you said, you know, Har- Howard would come back with the lyric, and you you provided a trampoline for him. Was there a moment? Because I actually had the experience with Howard of watching him rewrite a lyric on the on the couch at the record plant he was sitting while Les Poissons was being recorded. And he would say, wait, 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 I got a better one. And each successive line was funnier than what we just recorded. It was, which one do we save? He was so fast and brilliant. Did you have the experience of giving him a a melody and having him come back and you laughing out loud or just saying, Oh God, yes. Yes, Gaston, <laughs> the whole concept of Gaston just had me on the floor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, uh, you know that he's proud of how far he could spit, that I use antlers in all of my decorating. <laughs> I mean, we, we now take that, you know, for, oh, for granted. Funny. But the idea that Howard thought I use antlers in all of my decorating. Decorating. <laughs> I could just fall over. Um, how, one thing about Howard, by the way, he was great, especially with his comedy numbers. He, the essence of Howard Howard Ashford comedy numbers, he's great at beating up his own characters. He basically savages them because you know because it, 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 with this, with a comedy song, you you want to feel smarter than the people someone singing it because you want to laugh. At them as you know, as well as like with them, you know. So, the fact that you're getting a, a a song of tribute from a room full of morons to a complete Neanderthal <laughs> um, is very funny. And then with that with that Howard Ashford, I, I use it. You know, every last inch of me's covered with hair. I mean, it's just <laughs> hilarious. And so, yeah, I've had that experience a, a number of times with Howard where, and, and, but for me, anytime I sat in front of a Howard Ashman lyric was uh, incredible. And I had the experience, you know, Howard had, okay, you know, as we know, Howard passed away before even seeing Beauty and the Beast. The only one he oh. saw was Little Mermaid. He never saw Beauty and the Beast. He never saw Aladdin. Um, and um, and Howard had been gone for a long time, and I was playing a a, a D twenty three show. This was maybe I don't know six eight years ago. I can't remember. It was right after Marvin Hamlin passed away. And for this musical smile, Howard and Marvin had written a song called Disneyland, that was mm-hmm. in the musical um, Smile. It was a beautiful song, um, and I thought. Okay, it's it would be I should I would love to because I normally perform the concert of my own songs, but I want to perform this song of Howard's and Marvin's at D twenty three. But I you know I want to be able to make it sort of my own to a degree. So let me just put the lyric sheet. I I went on the internet. I downloaded the lyrics to to Disneyland. I knew basically how how the song went, hmm. and I sat for the for the first time in maybe twenty years in front of a Howard Ashman lyric. And and there was a specificity of this of this girl singing a, about her journey and, and going to Disneyland. And I just wept. It was incredible because of the memory of what of just how much of his soul and spirit came through those lyrics. Uh, it was it was it's just incredible. Um, I wonder if so, the yeah, success every... of lyricists, I mean, you've obviously written with some of the greatest lyricists on the planet, but I do wonder when I hear this and know how incomparable Howard Ashman's lyrics are, 
does a Tim Rice or a Glenn Slater or a David Zippel think, God, I hope Alan thinks this is as good as Howard. Well, maybe. Yeah. I, listen, when I was working with Chad Beglin, you know, on the, on the Aladdin Broadway show, he was, oh, and, and, <laughs> and of course, uh, uh, Pasek and Paul Benj and Justin came in. And again, everybody, including me, is in awe of Howard. So it's, there's a lot of that, but, Oh my God, there are songs I've written with, with each of those lyricists that just blow me away. And they all have their own amazing essences. I'm now working on, you know, uh, the, the sequel to Enchanted. I'm back working with Stephen Schwartz again. Hmm. And Stephen's lyrics are just knocking me over. They're so good. Oh, that's um, great. And working with, with Glenn Slater on this new project with John Lasseter, an animated called Spellbound. And, um, you know, so I, I have a, you know, I love the lyricists I work with, and uh, and each each relationship, you know, is, has different nuances to it. And I know you were going to ask me about, I think you were going to ask me about Lynn, right? Lynn Manuel. Well, just I yes. saw her. I oh yeah. I didn't realize. Yep. That you'd done something. He's, he's yeah, Lynn uh, and I, on on Little Mermaid. Say, yeah. Backstory. Right. Um, my sister. Uh, was an act actress and she was a fiddler and she her, she her she her daughter grew up in manhattan went to the hunter school and i would constantly hear jenny my my niece went to school with this little boy named lynn manuel miranda and i said oh this he's he's unbelievably obsessed with little mermaid and could you sign this for him or he has a question <laughs> about this and there was just like this test little bit lynn manuel miranda um, um and years later i mean lynn's named his son sebastian um and uh, uh sean bailey i think so an interview and suggest why don't we maybe you and lynn should collaborate on some songs for the movie i said wow that was this was after hamilton um and um and i had met lynn. i mean i had gone to, as soon as in the high open, i went to see lynn what a, he's a wonderful incredible talent and i Love him as a person, and so we we collaborated on five new songs and had an absolutely great time. That was a challenge because our styles are so, you know, he was like when he would try to do a Mencken type of song, so to speak. He was, I know, going, oh, this is. He even in some interviews talked about how intimidated he was about following in howard's footsteps and then when we did a lynn manuel miranda kind of song i was pretty intimidated and in trying oh. to follow in and those footsteps but you know we came up with some great stuff i can't i, I can't talk specifically about it very much because i'm constrained we're now we're in the middle of filming but we had a great experience it was a, it was um so much fun the, the Little Mermaid cast, by the way, is stacked. It has Melissa McCarthy, Aquafina, David Diggs, Holly Bailey, Jacob Tremblay. I mean, there's a lot of singer. You're not going to have to worry about bringing in a singer uh, to to fill these parts. But I'm curious because it's live action and well, pe I don't know, pe people don't know how good a singer Melissa McCarthy is. She I was just going to ask you have have uh, without revealing anything. Can you can you talk about uh, uh, obviously if they're shooting, you've probably worked on a lot of the music by now we did it before the, just before the pandemic i mean literally hmm. we were recording vocals and and i had to like then you know fly out because i didn't know if i'd get home from the uk what a crazy time yeah but is that she, was last last year were, were you when 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 you found out that she was going to play Ursula, did did you know she was a singer? Like, what was your had you had any connection with Melissa McCarthy before? I just kept remembering when she did uh, this this wild sort of funny Pocahontas uh, Colors of the Wind on the Tonight Show, <laughs> and had like confetti blowing in her hair. And and when I when I look back, I realized she was actually lip syncing, but. Um, no, I didn't know. Um, I had faith that we could get it. I I don't fret about that stuff too much. I um, we have a lot of uh, uh, we have a lot of insurance in in the yeah. ways we work. Uh, so that I I don't I don't operate from from fear or, or being overly cautious. I just go let's let's do it, 
and um, and I've been very blessed, very you know, very fortunate in terms of the results. But if need be, you help it along. Are you on set for these films now that they're live action at all? Do you work? I'm, I'm a, I show up just you know they don't need me on set and huh. um, oh god the room is here. I, well, I'll tell you, so, no, they're not singing on set. They're just, first of all, they're just lip syncing anyway because we pre recorded everything. Um, and to me, it's an indulgence because, you know, if, if everyone knows me, knows that I'm a compulsive multitasker. I just work on eight projects at the same time. Um, and it's, I, I just, I get, if, uh, you know, because you know that projects always go into lulls. So I want to always have something I, I'm working on. So, flying over where all the films are being done now almost you know overseas or so many of them are um so i uh, no generally i'm not there the, i'd the, love to ask you answer. um before we wrap up about uh working with robin williams obviously that was such an iconic character and i can't imagine the freelancing he must have done. He's such a, a, a character in himself and oh. the voices he can do and the range he has to, to do something like that. What was that like for you? And, and can you talk about just a little bit about your time working with him in the studio and, and taking the song that you guys wrote and, and bringing Robin into it and, and making it his own. Sure. Sure. Um, I had, first of all, an interesting backstory. Um, Howard went to college. One of his best friends was a woman named Valerie Velarde. Um, Valerie was Robin's first wife. Mm -hmm. So I, and I remember Howard talking about that, you know, when you know, Robin was sort of coming up, up, up that, that Robin had been married to, and then, of course, divorced from from uh, Valerie. So there was, there was that little oh, that's that sort of connection existed. Howard was gone by the time we were doing Aladdin, so he never was in the room. Um, as we were doing uh, the movie, uh, uh, Robin was working on Hook, so he has mm -hmm. come from full days uh, in this harness. And that's what he was doing at the time, the flying harness on the set to his house he was um, renting. I think it was actually Barry Levinson's house. We had a little spinet piano and we'd go to the house, me and David Friedman, and work with Robin on you know, learning the notes of the two songs. And Robin learned every note. Well, Alibaba had them 40 thieves, Shaharazadi had her. So he had every note, because <laughs> that was my big concern. Can he, can he sing the notes? And can he sing like Fats Waller? And everyone looked at me like, do we really give a damn? We don't care, Alan. Let him just be Robin Williams. I said, no, he has to sing the notes and sing. And, Ro and Robin, you know, what about? And he came into the studio and I got the take. What about? I had them 40 things. And everyone said, and also took with Prince Ali, same thing. All right, Alan, are you happy now? I said, yeah, yeah, good. Great. Now we're going to let Robin play. And of course, ninety-eight percent of what's actually in the movie is Robin just playing, and it was insane, amazing. Um, I don't know where those tracks are, but oh my god, the stuff that just flew out of this, you know, brilliant mind. Um, and uh, and then you know, Robin would afterwards, he really nice, quiet, uh, somewhat shy man. Um, we never got to know each other personally all that well as sweet as as could be and you know brilliant do you think um, his character the way he brought some of that stuff out changed the way some things were animated on screen oh god do i think <laughs> yeah um it's at least i mean what robin is it, it, it's the mother load of of comic brilliance um unreal yeah just contrasting yeah. that to to Will Smith coming in and and playing that character, it's it's an iconic role. Probably some pressure on Will Smith to deliver because a lot of people yeah. thought like, "How are you going to remake this?" But you were able to. I mean, if you listen to the the song versions, the Robin Williams one is very like trumpet 
forward almost and the and the will smith one is very drum forward uh playing into his hip-hop ability how do you how do you work with will smith to sort of reinvent that but also make the audience feel like this is the song that i i still remember uh it's such an easy answer i just got out of the way (laughs) just get out of the way i'm an architect go live in the house make the house your own um it's it two influences it was robin influence and then there's also guy ritchie influence guy mm. ritchie directing a musical was already like a crazy concept and guy obviously wanted something very pop oriented throughout the entire movie everything much more you know contemporary so um you know this is the third time around for aladdin and, and for the most part i'm just like you know other than the writing the new songs with uh, benj and justin I really just kind of my job was just get more or less get out of the way. I was nice. I was going to write the score, the score, but the score was still going to be adaptation of themes and needed to provide what the director wanted tonally, um, you know. And I just stepped back. That's that was true with Beauty and the Beast with Bill Condon, and it's true with Little Mermaid with with Rob Marshall. Um, it's, it's the stupidest thing I could do is. Is, is try to jump in there and have a huge influence um, because it's, I've already had the animated. We already had the Broadway show. Please, God, do what <laughs> I think you you've want. Earned, make it, I think you've earned the well, position of, yeah, let them do it. Make it fresh. Make God it bless. Less, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Last thing I want is every like every version of Aladdin to have ba-da-da, ba-da-da-da-da-da, I can show. No, I want every every different one to have its own arrangement and to be fresh and new. And last thing I want is for it to feel like you took one and then moved it there and then moved it there. And I can, to an extent, reinvent it maybe, but I'm so much better off allowing others to bring their influences to bear in it. That's why I like the mindset of, of a composer who does what I do and what those of us who work in musical theater or musicals in general be that we're architects. We design a house that others live in nice, and, and design it really well, put all the work into designing it. I want the rooms in the right place. I want that. I, I need, you know, the stairway has got to come to the right opening. It's all got to work. And then people, you know, maybe there'll be a hundred owners of, of that house or for that blueprint and everyone's going to do their own thing with it. And that's great. It's a wonderful I, analogy. It's beautiful because some people might want to hang paintings in the foyer and some might want to put carpet up the stairs and yet yeah, the, the bones of the house are there. Yeah. And I, and I love that. You, you don't want to control it, but there's, you know, there are lines like with, with Little Shop of Horrors. We had, a, we had in LA a, a transgender Audrey, who, who was mm-hmm. wonderful. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, sometimes it comes back to the estate, the Ashburn estate, and they feel a responsibility to try to, you know, protect um, Howard's legacy. For the most part, I just, my, my philosophy about, about all this is just have fun with the material. It's not going to, nothing's going to hurt me in what you do. Um, but it's in that first iteration where I'm going to have the strong, you know, there I want to have the, the control. And then is there an Alan Menken back. album ahead of us? And you might forgive me if this has been made already of you singing your greatest hits. There is not an album. Why um, not? And, and, and I'd like to own that. <laughs> I listen, I want to make it. Um, and I've been talking about making it, it keeps getting very complicated. Um, a, because uh, as opposed to making it, you know, 20 years, 30 years ago, whatever, when Columbia wanted to make it, um, in terms of my material, first of all, this budget, um, unless it's going to be just Alan Menken at the piano playing his songs. I'll go for um, that. It's a lot of, yeah, it's a lot of work. <laughs> um, <laughs> my voice is not, I had, I used to have, I had a great voice, I forgive I had a voice that would just go, you know, into the stratosphere. I blew that voice out 
a long time ago. Probably you know, just just the Hercules demos alone probably um, shredded my vocal cords. Um, but yes, the, the short answer is I would love to make that album. I probably will make that album at some point. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'll enjoy doing it. I do my concerts, as you know, our friend. I've heard Richard you Krebs. play. And yeah, yeah, so I think your voice sounds great. Um, I heard Thank something you. recently on, that you recorded for a oh, friend oh. of ours birthday. And uh, oh. <laughs> I thought you sounded great. I thought he should be making records, but we'll do that on okay, our next thank you. our next episode. We'll do <laughs> Alan. How was it recording twelve songs back to back? Yay! Okay, all right. So thank you, like Robert. It's so that. great talking to you, Kenny. Great talking to you too. The pleasure, likewise. Is and uh, ho hopefully, ours. you can get uh, hopefully you can get Lynn Miranda his egot. Is that the goal? Len Manuel, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess so. In I fact, think he I just needs an Oscar. Uh, he probably, I, it's, I'm sure it's a, a shoe in for him. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, I get it. but you know, the egot is. I think it's a bit over. <laughs> it's it's a nice thing. Okay, it's 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 like a, I mean, a, like a lot of a lot of baseball players. I'm sure have hit for the cycle. <laughs> but the, you know, not all of them are in the Hall of Fame. So, but I think um, today we established a new benchmark, though. Like you, <laughs> we have to the find out. I think of the sixteen egots. Are you the only regot? I got it. okay. So, so by the way, there's a physical Razzie, and and I found out about it years, years, and years later. Just just like last year, I think, or a year before, I, and, and Rick from my office got in touch with him. I'll show this to you. Well, yeah, no, I will show it to you. Hold on. Um, and it arrived. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now watching Alan go to his trophy cabinet full of Oscars and Emmys and Tonys. He's returning to the camera with little drum so, roll. The Razzie. That's what a <laughs> now, Razzie see, looks see, like. See, it's, and it's, as soon as it arrived, all these different things fell off the Razzie because it's so well, cheap. Well, that's, I think, intentional. Um, they they make it cheap. Uh, I think. I, I you know, agree. it took four I, seasons of the show, but this is our first Razzie, Alan. And we are Worst so original honored. song. We're so honored to have a this Razzie the, winner. This is yes. the first time I've shown it on camera, and I'm, I'm getting tearful. Just I, I moved myself and deeply honored that we had an <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, come to score the podcast. Home of Razzie winners. This is great news. There you go. Alan Mankin. Alan, I'm giving thank you, you so much for uh, coming on the show. Oh, thank you. Working through it. the technology, of course. Um, you, there's obviously no sign of slowing down. Alan has a ton of stuff coming up. Uh, Little Mermaid and you said en Enchanted sequel coming up? This, this Enchanted Spellbound, a stage musical of Hercules, which we did in Central Park, which is mm. we're going to bring to the uh, stage opposite to uh, Broadway. Um, and the stage musical of Night at the Museum. Um, ah. And oh, a, a, a prequel to Beauty and the Beast, the backstory of Gaston and LeFou, that's going to be on Disney Plus. And, wow. Um, I don't know, You'll be busy in those low periods. And, and again, we want to thank uh, our sponsor, Spitfire Audio. Be sure to listen after the show today. We're going to play you a little demo cue of uh, some of the different packages they offer. You uh, can follow us. There's a number of ways. Twitter, at Score the Podcast. Instagram, at Score Movie. And Facebook, Score a Film Music Documentary. And don't forget to subscribe on Patreon to more Score. Tons more stuff year-round. We're going to be doing that uh, launching, of course, this season. So really excited about that. Thanks again. Alan Mankin for joining the show. We really appreciate it. And uh, best of luck to all of the big projects you have coming up. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. Love to you. Bye, guys. Cheers. Love to you, bye too. Bye. Thanks. Hey, SCORE listeners. We are so grateful for the support of Spitfire Audio, our presentation partners, they collaborate with people like Hans Zimmer and the Bernard Herrmann Estate to build sample libraries that elevate your music. You're about to hear a musical demo of what that sounds like. 
But first, as an exclusive to SCORE listeners, Spitfire Audio is offering 25% off your first order of Spitfire products. All you have to do is use the promo code SCORE2021 at checkout. Again, it's exclusive to you, our SCORE the Podcast listeners. Just go to SpitfireAudio.com and enter promo code SCORE2021 so they know we sent you. Now, check out this demo cue from Spitfire's latest Abbey Road 1 release, Wondrous Flutes. Again, right now you can save 25% off your first order of Spitfire products using the promo code SCORE2021. There are tons of different packages to check out. Go to SpitfireAudio.com and use that promo code so they know we sent you. We will see you in a couple of weeks right here on SCORE the Podcast.